Welcome everyone, all the home brewers at home out there in our virtual world. Welcome back to my kitchen. You've probably seen enough of it by now. I'll have to get an upgrade soon. Um, my name's Paul Daly. Thanks for coming back to Little Home Brewers. And a huge thank you to everybody that participated last week. It was absolutely fantastic. We've got some good feedback. And if you would have seen, uh, for those who missed it, the, it's up on YouTube by our Facebook links. We had over 500 people tune in and re received 175 questions that came over. Um, so we're really pumped with the participation for everyone. Uh, before we get into it today, uh, there's a couple of things that we'll cover off. Um, last week, you'll notice that we opened up the Q&A up the top there. <clears throat> We've actually removed that this week and we're going to do everything through the chat. So any questions that you've got coming through as, as amongst your normal chit chat on there, just throw it into um, the chat on there too. that will be fantastic. And also head across to the FAQs if we had, because we had some questions in the masterclass and everything else that you need to know from the masterclass from a bit more of a, um, a parameters of what we're doing. And if you missed anything, that's all there uh, last week, including more details on the competition as to, hey, Hamill from, uh, from Hamill Hill WA2. Perfect. Hopefully we've got that right too. Plenty of guys around there on the chat. Um, tonight we've structured the masterclass to cover the questions that we missed basically from masterclass one. We had a lot of content of pre-composed content. So bear with us as we try to cover as much as possible. We'll get to the end. We should have some time at the end after the all the questions we've compiled from the week to go through and answer those, as well as questions in the come in during that that are relevant to the topic each of the brewers will talk about. But as always, if you want to know more or anything, um, you throw it in there and we'll definitely get it. Tonight, from the questions that we compiled during the week, we're going to cover off a few different topics. We're going to be talking about water uh, for the guys and the home brewers that are interested on water, yeast, hops, fermentation, mashing, uh, consistency of your home brew for the guys out there who are having a little bit of trouble, um, ingredients, and heaps more. So get in there and ask the guys. Um, but there wasn't too many questions on malt in the Q&A. There was one or two. So... If you do have any questions on that, this is now's the time to get it out there with the brewers and our panelists, which is fantastic. So before we get onto the body, let's talk about our brewers again. So you'll notice on the screen there, you actually have four brewers instead of three brewers that you had last week. So say hello to everyone to your four brewers, but specifically before we get into uh, reintroducing the other ones, we've got a guy there with a fantastic mustache with a beautiful uh, kettle behind him in a beautiful old building. Looks like Little Creatures Geelong. Everybody, this is Tom Wood. Tom, say hello to the virtual homebrewing world. How's it going, everyone? I'm stoked to be here with a couple of other fantastic brewers, and it's yeah, good to good to be on the panel. Tom, tell us about yourself. Are you a home um, brewer? When did you start brewing? Yeah, so I was a home brewer and still am. Um, started sort of creeping up to six or seven years ago now. Um, and homebrewing essentially got me um, into wanting to move into the industry professionally. Um, and so, yeah, persisted at that during uni and then um, eventually managed to work my way into the industry, which I'm very, very happy about. So, yeah, still a home brewer um, and started out as one. Perfect. And it's great to have Ru uh, Russ on, Tom on. Um, to bring some of that homebrew experience in there too. Hey, Russ, it's still great to have you too. While we're doing <laughs> it, we may as well introduce Russ again back. We may as well. Um, Russ Gosling, head brewer of Little Creatures Fremantle. And again, you might have mentioned last week, guys, been here since 2005 working for Little Creatures. Um, well, above him on my screen, but it could be anywhere on your screens out there, is Maddie J or Matthew Jessup. Matthew Jessup is our innovation brewer in Fremantle. And uh, he's the one to go to when we're talking about our concepts as a part of the program. Uh, any questions about that, how we create limited releases. We have the wonderful Alison McDonald, but always call her Ali Mack. She's the greatest thing since sliced bread. She has been working for Little Creatures Geelong for some time and only recently moved to Malt Trouble Brewery as a Libra um, in Sydney. And you'll mention that last week, guys, she is an active home brewer right now and she loves to brew beer in her kitchen on five litres, using uh, five litre brew kits, five litres at a time, using the colander and then backing it up, making gnocchi in the same colander. Is that right? <laughs> yep. After, That's a, what good, I got after a good clean. After a very good <laughs> clean. Absolutely. 
So there are our panelists, guys. We've got some great people. Oh, I forgot to say, at Ali Mac, president of Pink Boots Australia. We can't miss that one out there. There were some comments from some um, lovely female uh, home brewers out there who wanted to know more about Pink Boots and more about women in the industry. And Ali will go on to that one there too. Tom, I've already seen a question up there asking if you're single. So, mate, um, oh. maybe we keep that for the show notes. <laughs> they can probably leave that to the end. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, brewers. Now, for those watching, let's get into this week's masterclass. As mentioned, we've split the questions from masterclass one into topics, and we'll throw those questions out to all our brewers on the panel. Um, we'll give them a good chance to have a crack at it. We've gone through it before, and some of our brewers have some great experience. Like I mentioned last week, remember, Matty J has some fantastic experience brewing in Bavaria and all over Germany, so really good classical beer training. Uh, Russ has some fantastic history of brewing in London and around the UK in traditional car scales. And then we've got Tom and we've got Ali here who can answer in some practical home brewing um, questions that might be relevant to you now. Uh, don't forget to use the chat. Come through. We'll keep the single uh, questions for later on. So let's start with some questions. And we're going to lead off with, uh, with water today, folks. So the first one we got up from last week was, Russ, how important is water profile for some of the guys using tap water at home? Right, water, water, water. Oof, this is a very complex uh, subject is water. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about water from the creature's perspective. Uh, Tom's going to kind of go through some kind of homebrewing stuff and then MJ's found some good stuff on the resources to help people. And we'll go through that shortly. But um, so, yeah, raw water then. Uh, needs to be clear, odour free and taste okay. So I would suggest that brewers need to get into the habit of tasting their water um, and looking at it and making sure they're happy with it. Um, it also needs to be chlorine free um, and actually free of heavy metal ions as well because they're quite toxic to yeast. Um, now, most people at home these days have a filtered water tap, I know I do, which removes all the chlorine. So I'd suggest investing, if you haven't already got one, I'd suggest if you're an avid home brewer to, to get yourself a carbon filter on, on a drinking water tap and, you, and use that as, um, as your source of raw water. Um, now, we call water liquor. Um, in the brewery and um, it contains mineral salts which is basically calcium magnesium and sodium bound to things like chlorides sulfates um, carbonates and bicarbonates and that creates the water profile basically and all over the world uh, wherever you are uh, water has a different profile basically uh, different, it contains uh, different uh, levels of, of um, those mineral salts, basically. Now, there's three really important things to get right. The first one is your mash pH. Um, now, most water uh, in Australia is soft, um, and so you, you're going to achieve the mash pH by actually getting the level of calcium in your water right. Um, now, traditionally, uh, our German friends uh, used to use lactic acid malt. Um, so you, you can get the pH right by either adding calcium or hydrogen ions. Um, but ultimately, uh, here at Creatures, we basically get the amount of calcium right in there. So, for example, um, you know, the, the level of calcium, you're going, to, you're going to say, what's the right level of calcium? Well, that would depend on the malt grist and therefore the beer style that you're actually making. So, for example, an IPA, you'd be after about 150 ppm of calcium. For a lager, say 100 ppm. And then for a stout, something like 20 ppm. Now, I think MJ's found some good um, resources from... Uh, the state-based water corporations that are going to help you navigate um, what the raw water is like in your area and then you can adjust accordingly. Um, the second thing to get right is the ionic spec of the finished beer. 
And really, when we talk about that, we're talking about the level of sulfate to chloride and therefore the ratio. So sulfate kind of gives you a dry, bitter uh, impact and chloride gives you palate fullness and smoothness. So the, the, the balance between those two is going to give you the balance between sweet and bitter. So you need to think about um, what you actually want in your finished beer. Now, traditionally, for example, IPAs and pales are very high in sulfate um, and, and very little chloride. Uh, but a pilsner, for example, might be higher in chloride and have very little sulfate. So you can do some research and get some books and work out kind of what, what, what you really need, depending on what beer style you're making. Then the other, th the other um, important thing is to get the level of mineral content right. So, for example, an IPA is very heavy in sulfate. Um, and so you'll need to add the right amount of calcium sulfate to get the level of calcium right in your mash, to get your mash pH right. But then you want the overall um, mineral content to be quite high in sulfate in the finished beer. And so you would do that by supplementing the amount of calcium sulfate you add to your kettle. Um, because if you added it all into your mash, your mash pH would be too low. Um, so really, make sure your raw water is good, clear, odour free and tastes okay, and free of chlorine. And then access some resources uh, and work out what you need to do to get your mash pH right, i.e. the amount of calcium. And then look at your what your chloride and sulfate ratio needs to be in your finished beer, depending on the beer style you're actually making. Very technical, um, but there's a, there is a lot of in, information on the internet and some resource, good resources you can <coughs> to help you navigate what actually is a very technical and complicated um, subject matter. Mash pH needs to be between 5 and 5.5. I uh, saw one question pop up there. It's uh, definitely one of the driest parts of any sort of beer training that uh, that we do there, Russ, is there's a lot of romance and about um, all the ingredients of, uh, of beer, but when you come to water chemistry, you sort of start to see some eyes glaze over. Um, yeah, any thoughts? <laughs> it's very complicated, and it takes a long time to get your head around it. But one thing, I'll, it is very, very important to get that right profile right in your finished beer. Um, and so it is worth researching and, 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 and having a really good think about it. Now, a lot of home brewers, I think, kind of dismiss the chloride sulfate kind of thing and, and just use sulfate in all their beers. But um, I would kind of suggest that you really need to get the ratio right and uh, don't dismiss chloride. Um, yeah. Russ, what about um, tank water or rainwater in terms of there's a lot of information about um, water that's coming out of our taps. Uh, has any of our brewers, yourself or any of the other brewers, Tom or Ali, had experience with rain or tank water? I haven't, I haven't used much tank water, no. Um, but a lot of people sort of insinuate or think that rainwater is um, a fair bit more pure than their tap water, but depending obviously on how clean your tank is and um, you know what sort of pipe work it's traveling through, it's probably um, a little harder to test, I suppose, because you don't have your sort of local council water report. Um, but probably assuming that rainwater tank, uh, rainwater tank water is fairly clean in terms of alkalinity and hardness is probably a fair bet, but um, without testing it directly, it's kind of hard to know. Um, Tom, sticking with you, uh, you've done a lot of home brewing and we're going to drag you straight in today. Um, how do you tackle your water consistency when you're home brewing? Yeah, so home brewing, back when I was home brewing, I was living in Adelaide uh, where I grew up. So we, as anyone living in Adelaide will know, don't have the best water in the world. So a lot of our taps in the kitchen, we have sort of just a normal tap water tap and then also a drinking water tap that normally um, is activated carbon um, underneath the sink. Um, so we were lucky in a way that we had such bad water that pretty much all of the water we use on tap is filtered. So um, um, I used 
carbon filtered water. I know I had a, a mate in Adelaide who, um, and I saw it in the in the chat, used a caravan filter, which is essentially a very similar unit to um to what you get under the sink. Um, but basically, just finding some easy small way of filtering your water. Um, if it is heavily treated like it is in Adelaide, moving over to Victoria, um, I believe in most areas, um, sort of chlorine as opposed to chloramine is being used and it's not as, uh, it's a lot more volatile. So leaving a fermenter full of water out overnight tends to do the trick. Most of it will flash off given enough time. Um, so yeah, we did I think have a lot a of people- question just then about too, about boiling too. So you, you mentioned overnight evaporation. What about boiling your water? Yeah, so- get rid of it? Boiling should do the trick as well. Obviously, that'll speed up the process and volatilize everything much faster. So certainly if you were sort of, you know, you'd just gotten your water in the morning and you wanted to get rid of any free chlorine that was in the water, giving it a good boil before you kicked off, um, even heating it up to a fairly high temperature should also uh, help reduce that free chlorine. Lovely. Thank you, mate. Um, Russ, uh, on Matty J, how, how do you keep water consistency between Geelong and Fremantle? Well, uh, very good question. I mean, there's a, a question just popped up about uh, John Noble asked about what about RO and and really RO mm. is the Rolls Royce of of water purification. For those who don't know, that's reverse osmosis. So it's a process where the water goes through to essentially strip out all the the chlorine, all the impurities, minerals, salts, and really bring that water back to its most basic level. And what we do as brewers is build in the components we want. So as Russ and Tom touched on about building in um, the calcium and the sulfates that we want into our water. Um, now, I, I was having a look online the other day, just having a look at this topic, and, and some good home brewing sites are selling <coughs> small RO units you can use at home. They're about 250 bucks if you want to go to that next step up from a, from a, um, from a carbon filter. So that type of technology is out there now for the home brewer. So um, it makes it exciting because it really gives the brewer at home much more control over their, over the other raw material they may not think about as much as malt and hops and yeast and et cetera. And it really gives you an extra level of control that you probably haven't had before. So for those who are, I guess, you know, more, more advanced or, or, you know, really want to, um, explore those opportunities. I mean, a home RO system is now available. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So both Freo and John have got RO plants, strip everything out, and then basically we add the same amount of uh, the various salts into either the mash tun or the kettle to get the desired you know, outcome that we want in the finished beer. Um. May Jay, do you want to touch on any of those resources that you spoke about that one, any of the resources that people can get a hold of to better understand the water properties in beer? I know Russ mentioned it earlier, but is there a way for people you can link people up to get in a hold of those? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, there's some really good resources out there that are absolutely free of charge. Um, if you go onto your local municipal water source website, so um, here in Perth where we are, Fremantle, I, I logged on to the local the website here and had a look at our water report i also went on to sydney water and they've got an excellent website for, for home brewers in the sydney area um and that'll give the, the home brewer a really good idea about i guess the, the the mineral concentration in their water and the levels that they've got to work with uh, and things they might want to look out for so there's that there's also some really good reading material that that brewers can can purchase and 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 look at um, there's a guy in the US called John Palmer who wrote one of the best books on water you can get, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, it's complex. It starts out you know, explaining the basic concepts, but it gets more and more complicated because it is a very, very complicated topic. Um, but there is a lot out there for the brewer. There's a lot of stuff online you can read, um, and there's a lot of different calculators and stuff that you can find that will help you out. That's great stuff. Um, nothing more exciting than um, calciums and chlorine in water today, guys. But I think it's very important to know that it definitely affects the way 
uh, your beer taste. And definitely that this this little creature's pale ale that I'm drinking here is tastes the same as uh, it was brewed in Geelong, tastes the same as Fremantle. And that's a good enough reason for us to get our water right. We're going to roll onto yeast, guys. There's some fantastic questions coming through and we'll get to them. That way we're capturing. I can see them popping up in my screen. Um, we're going to move on to yeast and we're going to throw it at Ali Mac, um, the great Ali Mac. Um, give us some tips of, for, for using yeast. So I love yeast. Um, it's probably like my favourite area and gets me very excited as opposed to water, which I know is very important, <laughs> but as we said, it's very um, complicated. So in terms of yeast, we had a few questions last week about the asking about the advantages or disadvantages of dried yeast versus liquid yeast. And I have to admit, I actually haven't used liquid yeast very often in my home brew or my professional brewing career, um, apart from when we've had stuff specially grown up for um, on a, from a slope for the brewery. So I mainly use dried yeast. So the really the advantage for dried yeast is um, its shelf life and its transportability. So um, there's been so much development and research done by the various yeast companies in the last few years. So they've been able to extend the shelf life of dried yeast from two years to three years now. They've been able to make it more, um, I guess, stable. And then in terms of transport, it lends itself a bit better to being able to be transported at ambient temperature. I mean, ideally you'd want it um, stored cold, but it does. it is a bit more forgiving. And then also with that research and development, there's been a lot of work done on if you need to hydrate your dried yeast before you use it. So I was always taught, you know, um, hydrate that dried yeast in a bit of lukewarm water to get it ready before it goes into your fermenter. But a lot of the yeast companies are now saying they've got it to the point where you can just throw your yeast in and not worry about hydration. Um, and it's the same with aeration. So um, I know we had a few questions about aeration and oxygenation. So it was always that thing, like it's when you put your yeast in, you need to aerate it, give it, you know, big stir in the fermenter. It's that last point that you want oxygen coming into contact with your beer. Um, but again, a lot of the yeast companies are now saying, actually, you can put it in without a lot of aeration um, and that physical movement might actually be doing more damage by the agitation. So mm -hmm. there's lots of really exciting and new information coming out about yeast. Um, as I said, you can search a lot of it online and it's really developments that have only come out in the last 12 months or so. Um, there was also a question last week about over pitching or under pitching yeast. And really you don't wanna be doing either. Um, on your yeast packet or if you search online, there'll be information about what the pitching rate is and there's lots of calculators as well to help you work this out. So the reason you want to get your pitching rate right is because either way, your yeast isn't going to be happy. So if you over pitch, you're not going to have enough um, sugars there for the yeast and they're not going to be happy and that can cause problems. And then if you're under pitching, you're going to be likely to get off flavours. So you don't want to do all this work and then have your beer not turn out right. So it's really important to get those pitching rates right. Um, but yeah, in terms of liquid yeast, I don't know if any of the other panelists have, Tom, I don't know if you've got a lot of experience with it. No, um, I guess not buying liquid yeast. I've sort of reused yeast um, when I was sort of brewing a little bit more consistently at home. Um, that liquid yeast though essentially always started from a dry packet. Um, similar to you, Ali, I used to start I started out by just sort of following the instruction of the packet, rehydrating, doing all that. Um, but eventually after trying it enough, just pitching a packet dry and finding the results, you know, not really any different, not performing any worse um, and taking out a potential step for infection as well. Um, I just started, started throwing a packet in um, and that, that worked really well. So um, in terms of, liquid yeast there in this sort of liquid yeast that I um, have dealt with at home is stuff that I've taken off the bottom of a fermenter um, a very small amount and grown that back up in a starter um, which if you're into your biology and microbiology and you've got all the equipment to do it in a sterile fashion um, can be a really good way to sort of save on you know buying a, a packet every time you want to brew especially if you're um, brewing regularly. And I did just see a comment saying um, 
yes, there are definitely more varieties available in liquid yeast. So it's definitely, you know, it's all about what yeast you want to use and how you want to use it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, question there about, um, about yeast nutrient, and I think uh, it's an important thing to touch on. So if the brewers out there who are using dry malt extract, then um, using an amount of yeast nutrient will be beneficial as well to, to assist with um, uh, reducing the lag time and, and, and having a nice healthy uh, yeast and getting the fermentation underway. So there's a little tip there. Yeah, the yeast nutrient is very important and it's predominantly zinc, which is deficient in wort, but is a very important enzyme cofactor with alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, it, it is interesting. I think historically wet yeast, um, in terms of the yeast physiology, it was in a far better state for brewing. But I think to, as, as AMAC has just mentioned, that the technology has advanced to the point now where dried yeast is, um, is, is just as good. I was wondering though, Ali, as I've never used dried yeast, how, how do you get the pitch rate right? Is there some guidelines on the pack or? Like if you if you want eight pp you know if you want um, eight million cells or if you're brewing an ale or you want twenty million cells if you're brewing a lager how do, how do you how do you actually navigate getting the addition rate right? Tom's probably going to have more experience than I have, but um, yeah, there there is instructions on the packet um, for it, and it basically is how much dried you need versus how much to like how much liquid you're producing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, obviously, like at the brewery, if we're using dried yeast, kind of working out how many brick, like half kilo bricks we're using um, for propagation. And then at home, like I know in my small five litre batches, it's like half of a packet. So and usually on a 20 litre batch, it's like a whole packet. So it gives you that kind of calculation of, as I said, like yeast to liquid. Oh. Um, moving on with the, talking about yeast and talking about unique yeast, there were some questions around Quebec last week. Um, I'm going to throw it over to you, Russ, because we're having a conversation about this during the week. What is Quebec? What are your thoughts on it? Um, and, and actually, can guys out there use it in the challenge? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very exciting, actually, this yeast strain. So uh, we did some work with it. In our in our sand pit, which we talked about last week, um, but yeah, it's a Norwegian kind of farmhouse yeast strain, uh, which has gained some popularity recently. But um, it basically it ferments at high temperatures. You're talking like 35 degrees Celsius, so um, the ferment rockets along. Now, I, th I think most kind of uh, brewers of of my age were kind of a little bit cynical about what the resulting beer would be like in terms of fermenting that hot and what the characters would be like. But I, when, we, when we did some work in the sand pit, at, we were absolutely surprised by how clean that fermentation was. Um, and yeah, it, it just ferments extremely quickly, um, but gives this really, really good, uh, clean character, uh, which really took us by surprise. But the, the other thing that really surprised us was the fact that pretty much 24 hours after attenu attenuation and, and the beer hitting final gravity the yeast just dropped out of suspension to the point where you can just you can just move it to processing so um you know th this yeast has the potential to be a right game changer across the industry because you know you could almost brew on a monday and then have the beer ready to pack on a friday um, which is quite phenomenal, really. Um, and, and the beer is, 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 has been fantastic. The, the, I think we've done two batches in the sandpit, and both of them have been great. So it's definitely something that we think um, that, that we'd like to have a, have a bit more of a play with in the brewery, for sure. And when you say wild, it's not wild as in we're talking about bread animaises wild, right? Uh, it's not a super attenuator, so uh, it's not a diastaticus yeast. It doesn't yeah. excrete the enzyme. It's um, it's good, good stuff. Lovely. And apologise for the comments to the guys out there if I pronounced it incorrectly. You, you did, Paul. Kavik, Kavik. 
I think if you ask five people, you get yeah. five different answers <laughs> most of the time. You're, yeah, not, you're right. not Norwegian daily. I won't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've never been to. So, look, I'll, excuse me for that one. Um, Tom, one for you. In the big breweries, we, we use yeast on a commercial scale. Um, do you do this at home? Was there advantage of it? Yeah, so similar to how what I touched on before. So, in a big brewery, we tend to use eight to 10 generations of the same original yeast that we pitched up from a propagator. Um, that's sort of cone to cone um, at the correct pitch rate that we, that we need for the beer. Um, you can do a similar thing at home. You can, a lot of people, I know of a few people who simply get the beer out of their fermenter, there's yeast left in the bottom, chuck work back on top of that and call it a day. That's probably not the, um, you know, that's, a little bit of bucket science um you can sort of do a better job of that in terms of grabbing a little bit of that yeast um propagating it up in a flask with a stir plate i know there's plenty of home brewers out there that that have that equipment and that are comfortable doing it um but i guess the short answer is that you absolutely can keep using um that yeast but it's probably um it's harder to do at home and and keep it clean and sterile um but if you're confident that you can do it and i mean um you know, if you start to notice differences in the way it performs in fermentation, it's probably best to ditch it and start again. But it's definitely something that with the right equipment and a little bit of sort of biology knowledge, I suppose, it's definitely achievable um, and can save you a bit of money because realistically when you're home brewing, yeast is probably close to the most expensive ingredient, um, maybe just before or after hops. So yeah, um, can definitely be done. Uh, pros and cons? Pros and cons. Um, so the biggest the biggest pro is obviously, um, or if you're into that sort of stuff, it's it's interesting, it's enjoyable, but um, it will save you a bit of money and you won't have to go and buy fresh packets of yeast um, every batch, especially for me, I was brewing 12 litre batches, not big batches. So for me, it made a lot of sense in the, in the sense that I didn't want to be pitching half a packet, throwing half a packet away and, and doing that every brew. Um, so that's probably the biggest biggest pro is saving some of that money and not wasting so much dried yeast. Um, the biggest con by far is trying to keep things sanitary, trying not to introduce infection. Every time you handle yeast, every time you pick, um, you open your fermenter, you fiddle with things um, similar to the rehydration, you're giving wild organisms a chance to get in there and, and start messing with things. So. Um, the biggest biggest kind of sort of trying to reuse your yeast, repitch your yeast is that you're increasing that likelihood of introducing something you don't want. Um, and yeah, obviously that risk is, is always going to be there if you're not in a microbiology lab. And for those people who are trying to get, extend the life of their yeast, eight times we don't go past that. What, what can happen? What can we end up, what can happen in the happening in the beer if we start to overuse our yeast? Yeah, so if we if we keep repitching, sort of, and there there are breweries over in Europe that will that will say that they've had they've repitched the same yeast for generations over a hundred years, and that's that's fine if they're able to control that. But what you might start to see as you start pushing that eight to ten generation sort of number is um, differences in how it ferments, how far it ferments, how well it flocculates and drops out. So you might find that it's really starting to not drop out as nicely as it did. It might drop out too early and you might actually um, sort of under attenuate your beer. Um, and also as you keep repitching, if there's any spoilage organisms in the yeast that you are growing and repitching, you're going to be repitching and growing those spoilage organisms as well. So if you have a little bit of an off character in generation five, there's a, a likelihood that you're going to get that times 10 in gen eight or gen nine. So um, it's something that, yeah, as the, the further along you go, you might just start selecting for certain um, parts of that population and therefore um, selecting certain characteristics and not having it perform quite like it did uh, straight out of the packet. Yeah, good way to turn your, uh, your lager into apple cider. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to roll on the hops, guys, and thank you for all the... Um, the questions coming through we are picking up on those as they come through so as removing the topics don't get upset or worry that we're not going to come to you we will 
Um, Russ, you, Russ, Tom, you are getting some massive love out there. Russ, you did get some love this <laughs> then too. Hello, um, Russ. We've had, we've had no comments yet about your punk choice of music from last week. But hops, yeah. um, <laughs> let's throw it out there, guys. Hop flowers or pellets and why? Who wants to run with these? I think this is a great one for you, Russ. Hop pellets. Well, I touched on this last week, really. Um, it depends on, it really depends on, on the character you want in the beer. Um, obviously pellets are more stable, um, they've got a longer shelf life, uh, the bulk density is lower so they're easy to transport and store um, and um, uh, yeah, hot flowers is more difficult but you get a more refined, delicate hot character with hot flowers. Uh, pellets, there's more, more surface area for, for extraction of some of the unwanted vegetative uh, material, um, but it's totally up to you. Mm. Um, what about we've got some good questions on dry hops too? At what point are we dry hopping? Um, and what point or what point in a dry hop am I just wasting hops and my money? And where is that sweet spot for grams per litre? Yeah, good question. So, everyone's got a different view on this. Um, look, most of the data I've read tells you that between uh, six to eight grams per litre. So anything above eight grams per litre is just a complete waste of money. Um, and also it's uh, a further waste because you just get high amounts of beer loss as well. So you get a double hit. Uh, but then uh, there's brewers I know who swear that, you know, 10 grams, 12 grams per litre, it's worth it. But the data, unfortunately, kind of would suggest that anything above, certainly above eight grams per litre is um, a complete waste. So my answer to that would be somewhere between six and eight grams per litre. There's some incredible beers out there, and I think I mentioned some that just go well into the double digits. And um, I've started to have spoken to some people out there in trade, and they swear by they won't drink anything under 10 these days. So it's... Yeah, it's a very interesting thing when you start. Yeah, when you start to talk about on, on, on a commercial scale and the cost and loss involved. Um, Tom and Ali, how do you guys dry hop at home? Ali, I'll let you start if you like. Um, I so I actually haven't done that much dry hopping with hops. I've usually been putting other ingredients in, like vanilla or whatnot. Um, so I just just usually. Um, make sure like everything's sterilized in terms of like um, if it's going into a hot bag or um, whatever I'm using. And it's just that thing of having everything ready and just getting it in as quick as possible so that I'm not, um, when I'm opening up my fermenter, I'm not exposing it to um, too much air oxygen tation. Mm. Um, so yeah, just really, as I said, sterilizing my hot bag um, and putting it in and getting it in the fermenter as quick as I can. And that's very key, good because we did oh, – sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say because the key thing is as well is that you also want to get those things out um, mm. when you come time to uh, rack your beer or um, bottle your beer. So you want to be able to get those ingredients out, especially if you're using something like uh, vanilla beans or <laughs> uh, coffee. Um, yeah, because you can get into all sorts of trouble trying to remove those from your fermenter. Yeah, because there was a question last week from a, a home brewer saying, how do I dry hop without opening the top or yeah, and a light? You, I think there's a bit of a worry about oxy getting too much oxygen into the beer. Yeah, you uh, you have to open your fermenter. It's just you want to be doing it. You don't want to – you just want to have everything ready so that you you don't go and open it and then you think, oh, I'm missing those hops. I haven't weighed something out. <coughs> I haven't done something. You just want to have everything ready so you can open it, put it in, shut it. Yeah, perfect. And Tom, but your own experience at the same thing? Yeah, very, very similar. Um, I've not yet found a very good way to get dry hop in without opening the lid. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you, there's people out there with all sorts of crazy contraptions. But um, as Ali said, trying to minimise the time that you've got the lid open, get the hops in there, get the lid back on. Um, and hopefully as well, when you drop the pellets in, try not to throw them in. Um, but if you do get a little bit of nucleation off the pellets, you'll find that a little bit of CO2 sort of does get um, purged out the top of the fermenter and <coughs> oxygen shouldn't be too much of a concern. Um, I saw a couple of questions down there about how long to put hops in and when to put hops in. 
Um, and I always found when I was home brewing that a lot of home brewers, um, and this might be sort of a few years ago now, tend to leave dry hop in for quite a long time and end up picking up um, a little bit of harshness and sort of veg vegetal characteristics from that. Um, so one really good way to do it is to just dry hop, taste it each day, and when you're happy with it, just get it off the hops. It doesn't need to be sitting there for, for two weeks or a week, um, three or so days, and really you should be getting all you, all you need out of it. Um, but, yeah, my, my method was quite literally to just open the lid, get them in there, and get the lid back on as soon as I could and not stress too much about it really. And I, th I think that's a really good tip, Tom, about uh, just tasting tasting the beer each day because it can it can change we've just been brewing something at um malt shovel and it's been amazing the difference um one day has made to um the dry hop character of the beer yeah definitely and i saw another question about you know is adding um dry hop at the start of fermentation or during fermentation a waste of time certainly not um getting some of those hop oils in early when yeast, uh, yeast is active um, can give you all sorts of nice flavours from biotransformation and things that you can't get um, when the yeast is dropped out and not doing it. So that's probably one other thing I'd add is to experiment a little bit um, when you add it, whether that's at the start of fermentation, in the middle, at the end, after chilling, see what works, see what you like, because they do give you um, very different results. Yeah. The question there earlier from someone regarding hop creep. Uh, in, in dry hopping and it's something that we've done a little bit of work on here in Fremantle and um, and it's a real phenomenon this diastase activity that's derived from hops in the presence of yeast is, is a real thing and 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 we've certainly noticed gravity decreases um, in our ferments further than what, what we were uh, predicting and planning upon so I guess um, what I would say to that is that that you really do need to monitor monitor your ferment and 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 make sure absolutely that your ferment's finished prior to to bottling, particularly bottling, um, as there's no way for the for any excess CO two produced to be vented. So um, so if you're dry hopping and looking to bottle, I would certainly um, you'd, you'd like to have two or three consecutive days of readings as a minimum. I was about to mention that so that's a really good question, hop creep mm. and uh, the impact of diastase. But one thing we've noticed in Frio is it's not, um, it doesn't necessarily, well, different hop varieties contain different amounts of diastase. But secondly as well, at the end of fermentation, um, you, you get a bit of a different effect in that um, some hops you use, you get a slow decline in gravity as the diastase works. Uh, but then there's other hops where we've noticed you get suddenly a sharp decrease and then all of a sudden nothing seems to happen for a day or two and then it sh drops again and yep. then nothing seems to happen for a day or two and then it drops again. Um, it can be really quite a challenge because... Um, you kind of think, oh, it's done, and then all of a sudden, bang, you get another drop. So um, the kind of approach we've taken is to, at the end of fermentation, uh, warm crop your yeast, get it off, and then just leave, um, leave, leave the beer at that temperature. Um, and, and we've kind of almost, I suppose, taken a lager philosophy in the sense that we've kind of gone, well, it needs to be 17 or 18 or 20 days in fermenter, so a bit like uh, making a lava. So take that yeast off and leave it, and it'd be, it'd be quite interesting. You'll find it quite interesting to see how the gravity kind of drops. But don't, but don't, don't get tricked into thinking it's finished uh, and then move it on. Just, just leave it until you're 100% convinced. Yep, I think. Um, Regards to follow up on this one before we move on from hops, because it is a really interesting um, topic and a phenomenon, and again, a lot of talker out there in the brewing industry at the moment. If you get onto the Craft Brewers uh, mm. Conference page in the United States uh, last week, they had Tom Shellhammer from Oregon State University 
um, a, pure, a real expert in this area, um, doing a lot of study over there. And also Vinny Chaluzzo from Russian River Brewing Company and a few others on there talking about this and that. I think that webinar is still up there. So yes. it goes really into the technicalities of this um, and ways to overcome it and, and the, the causes are of, and, and, and they're about. So get on there and have a look at that one. Um, because we still want to get to all your questions, but hey, that, that hot creep one is fantastic. We don't want to um, over attenuate a beer and enzymes running around eating sugars that shouldn't be there. So, um, we're going to say one more over. thing, Daly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, with AMAC and Tom mm -hmm. were talking about when they're dry hopping, the importance of tasting your beer each day until you get to the point where you're happy with it. And uh, when I talked about water, I talked about the importance of tasting your water. And, you know, we can talk about tasting malt, et cetera. But the point I wanted to make is it's so important for brewers, it doesn't matter whether you're professional brewers or home brewers, to actually use your palate and taste, taste, taste. It's just, it's just so important. It's, it's, um, it's just key to everything that we do. So taste your water, taste your malt, taste your beer, and just use that kind of... Um, you know, you, you use your taste to kind of guide you as you brew. It's, it's, it's super important. And, and the second to that too, and, and just as important as well is for brewers out there, um, is, is, is to really take notes about what you're doing. Um, uh, I think it's so important to, as you're going through the brew day, um, your times, your temperatures, your gravities, original gravity, fermentation performance, how long it took, when did you chill the, or when did you take the yeast off, and what did you do, and what does the beer taste like? And that will help you when you go back, and when you read your notes, because, you know, you mightn't brew for, for a week or two or a month, and when you go back and when you try and reproduce that really great beer that you made, if you've got a really good solid set of notes, then you'll be able to have reproducibility, which is, I think that's the key between really good brewers and, 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 and guys that just make average beer. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. And I think as well because you will not remember what you've done. You think you're going to remember. And as you said, it, Matt, if you, haven't be, if you haven't brewed it for months, you're not going to remember. And what um, at the moment I'm also encouraging my brewers as well with uh, their NPD stuff is it's um, not just... What is it? Just wait there, Ali, before oh. we go on. What is NPD? There's a lot oh, of guys sorry. out here who probably don't know sorry. our acronyms. Um, new, product, <laughs> new product development. So um, we're all having a play on our, um, our little mini kit at Malt Shovel at the moment. So also besides keeping records, asking everyone what worked well, what did you like about the beer and what didn't work well and what would you change for next time? Absolutely. It's you, vital. You can, you're going to forget what it tasted like and what it was what was great about it in you know six months time when we might look at doing it on a bigger scale so records are so important beautiful um that was a sensational topic on hops and i'm not i'm definitely uh not surprised considering uh people's love affair with hops as an ingredient in beer and the what the, the styles are coming out now being so hop forward i'm going to move into some style specific questions and mj we've got one straight up for you um just talking about styles of beer so um, close to your heart or just over the board, I brewed a few Czech Pilsners but can't really nail that noble hop aroma. Can you give many tips? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, Czech Pilsners. So, I mean, they're known for hops. They're known for bitterness. So I guess the first things I would look at is what variety of hop are you using? Um, is it one of the classical noble varieties, Czech Sars? Um, and then, then there's some noble varieties in Germany, Tetnanger. Hersbrucker, some Hallertau hops, things like that. Um, sometimes they're, you know, well, often they're, they're quite low in alpha acid, so you need to use a bit more. So if you want that bitterness, if you want, want that really nice, strong Czech bitterness in your beer, you're going to have to use a little bit more. And to develop that aroma, you may need to increase uh, the component you use at the back end of your process. So late kettle, whirlpooling if, you, if you're doing that or like a whirlpool addition um so there's a, there's a couple of things there also some things we talked about earlier about um after your whirlpooling so chilling for the home brewers so 
trying to get that beer cooled down as quickly as possible because the hop oils are very volatile. They flash off. So the longer it takes to cool your beer and get into your fermenter, the more character you're going to lose. If, if you can only cool it down slowly, then you'll need to use more hops to keep the character where you want it. So there's a couple of little things, I think, on check uh, check pills. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Um, I enjoyed a check pills today, so I'm, I'm a big fan of those. I think the three of us, uh, Russ, MJ, and myself, noted uh, pills now, although gentlemen, as one of our favourites. Um, I hope that answered a few questions for that one, guys. Again, the alpha acids are low, pretty low compared to some of the other ones, and we might cover it on, but you know, some of the new aroma hops do have quite high alpha acids compared to the traditionals. Uh, Russ, uh, brewed a milk stout and noted my mash pH was under five. What would you recommend I could do to get my water or grist to, to do to my water or grist to get the pH up? Okay, another water question. So, um, yeah, when you, when you mash, the calcium uh, reacts with buff buffering compounds, um, phosphates and polypeptides to release hydrogen ions. And converts to that carbonates and bicarbonates absorb your hydrogen ions. So you really need to look at your water. So the answer to this question is either reduce the amount of calcium you're adding, or if not, add some calcium carbonate. Simple. So how good is water chemistry? It's just straight, it's just, it's just black and white, isn't it? That's <laughs> so easy. Yeah. Um, well, there's one more uh, one I think we'll chuck out. It's related to little creatures. Um, there's, a, there's a fellow or a, or, a, or a lady online, and they're having issues with brewing um, American style pale ales. So, he wants to brew in a Sierra Nevada style pale ale, something similar to little creatures. What hops do we use in little creatures? Any hints or Sierra Nevada pale ale? It's quintessential to that style. Any tips we could give them to, um, to bring that to life? Cascade and plenty of it. Maybe a cascade. Mm. That's it. And Chinook. Uh, well, yeah, and so, yeah, so American Pale Ales are English IPAs and American hops. Simple. So the predominant hop is Cascade, but then most brewers use a seasoning, a little seasoning of something else to complement it. Uh, so we use Chinook, but you can use something like Summit, for example. Uh, but MJ's right. It's basically Cascade. Uh, with a little seasoning of something else, uh, normally something big and robust. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an English IPA with American hops. So get yourself some Cascade and a little bit of Chinook or something, and go for it. Yeah, I think it's important for those styles too that American pale ales have changed a lot. And in 1979, 1980, when the boys over there were brewing that, that those are the hops that were available. Um, there was a mosaic come up there. Note that mosaic didn't come out till 2012. So um, there's a big difference and there's a big difference in those beers. Um, I was lucky enough to try some fresh Sierra Nevada recently that was imported and it was very pine and very citrus and very bitter. And it was very different to some of the American pale ales and the hops are being used now. And it was very refreshing. Very, I really enjoyed that beer. Just a um, one, Paul, from Tristan mm -hmm. Menzies said, and some EKG, and he's absolutely right. So we use EKG or East Kent Goldings as the bittering hop. So that provides the bitterness, the backbone, but the aroma and, and the characteristic that really is the hallmark of Little Creatures Pale Ale is, is, is those um, American or North or Pacific Northwest hops, the Cascade and the Chinook. Yeah, wonderful. We, we add EKG because um, I suppose that there's a view that there's, there's a number of hops which produce what, what's called a fine bitterness. Um, so not, not a harsh, raw bitterness. EKG is one of them. Uh, Magnum from Germany is another. But yeah, each brewer has their own specific viewpoints on this. But yeah, EKG is fantastic. Uh, between hop, very fine. Um, and uh, yeah, a bit of cascade and some chinook, and away you go. Lovely. Yeah, Hamilton, um, uh, yeah, lupal and dust and powder. So there's I've none seen, of that in Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Matty J. Come on, mate. I've seen, I've seen a couple. No, don't, of didn't exist back then, except on the on the finger of someone who just uh, moved a bale of uh, 
bale of hops. We're going to keep that question, Sean, because we do have to move on, guys. Um, we're going to move on to ca- talking about a little bit about uh, calculators and recording. And Tom, I'm going to throw this one to you. We had one about um, original gravity and specific gravity. So any recommendations on cal- uh, calculators for both? Yeah, so calculators is one where, I mean, if you throw brewing software or brewing calculator into Google, you're going to get quite a lot of results. And to be completely honest, if you click any of those first 10, you're going to get something that does the job and that's fairly useful. They're, they're all really the same thing dressed up in a different way. So go online, have a Google, see what other people, go on some forums and see what other people like to use. Brewer's Friend has always been something I've used that, are, uh, that has worked for me. Um, uh, what else have we got? You've sort of got your business and other software like that. So if you're looking for calculators, um, yeah, really have a have a search, see what you like, and it's going to be more about the feel of the program or the software as opposed to the um, the actual sort of cogs of it. Um, yeah. Easy. What a simple question. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, we're going to stick with you, mate, because we're going to roll into fermentation and conditioning. And I think there's some important things here that does relate back to yeast, but also wasn't covered in there and some troubleshooting as well. Um, we did get a question last week and we're going to throw it over to you, Tom, as we mentioned. Um, my clear fermented beer goes hazy after conditioning, nothing in suspension, aroma and taste, but the taste is good. What's going on with the beer there? What's some of the issues? Yeah, so um, I guess in beer, we have a few different types of hazes. We have biological haze and we have non-biological haze. Um, and that question essentially refers to what we know as chill haze, which um, as the question sort of insinuated, they didn't see any particulate or any sort of bits and pieces floating around in their beer. Um, the yeast had all dropped out, but the beer wasn't clear. It wasn't bright. Um, and that normally is... Um, or almost always is chill haze. It's basically just a complex of protein and polyphenol. And there's a few there's a few ways to deal with it. Um, on the hot side, when you're when you're boiling, adding uh, something like Compact or Whirlflock, um, which is um, readily available at your home brew shop, um, adding that will will get rid of a lot of that protein and drop more out in the whirlpool. Um, and that means you're not carrying it over into the fermenter. Having a really good, strong, vigorous boil um, to remove as much hot break as possible, removing that in the whirlpool, not letting that get into the fermenter. Um, And the same goes with cold break as well, trying to minimise, letting a little bit into the fermenter, but trying to minimise the amount of protein that we're getting uh, into into the fermenter. Uh, In the mash, watching your mash pH. So we touched on water and mash pH and why it's important for flavour, but also um, if you have a mash pH that's way too high, you're going to extract a lot more tannin and a lot more polyphenol into the wort. Um, and then that's going to be able to essentially oxidize, react with protein um, and form those complexes that form haze. Um, so trying to deal with it on the hot side um, before you see it in conditioning is, is much easier than trying to get rid of it after fermentation. But if you do have chill haze and you are worried about it, um, the easiest way to get that beer to, to clear up is to... Um, get it as cold as you can without freezing it, obviously, and giving it some time to settle out. Those complexes will come out of solution. So the reason that you get it when you chill the beer is that when it's warm, those complexes are soluble. And so they dissolve into the beer and you can't see them. And the the beer looks nice and bright. The yeast has dropped out. Everything looks great. Um, But then once you drop the temperature of the fermenter or the bottle or whatever um, the beer is in, those complexes are no longer soluble. and they come out of solution and give you that haze. So if you can get the beer cold, let that come out of solution and then start to drop out, you may be able to um, get rid of some of that chill haze, um, obviously preferentially before it's ended up in the bottle. Um, But in terms of not affecting flavor or anything like that, when it's your homebrew, um, it's not something to be overly concerned about. It's, It's purely aesthetic. Perfect, mate. That's, um, I think there was a few questions that came through or there's a few commentary to come through. As soon as I said that, as a, um, people were straight on the chill haze. So it looks like we've got some uh, people who are definitely onto it. But at the same time, we all got to keep in mind there's people out there who are, int- uh, are walking into their home brewing journey. Um, and this is all great stuff for them to, to keep going through. Uh, Russ, <clears throat> I'm drinking a Little Creatures Pale Ale because obviously I wouldn't drink anything less. 
um, I hear there is a little picture on the box that shows some little live yeast and talks something about um, bottle conditioning. Can you talk to us about the pros and cons on bottle conditioning and what on earth it is it? Oh, thanks for asking that question, Costa. Appreciate that one. Costa's um, back. Oh, it's uh, here. It's uh, right. no <laughs> oh, mate, look, I'm... Oh. Oh. Let's answer the question. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Uh, bottle conditioning, very good question. So um, yeah, there's two options, really. One is you can bottle condition, which means that you, at the end of fermentation, your beer is, say, at four grams per litre, and you package it, and you add some sugar and some yeast and let it naturally carbonate in the bottle or in pack. Um, to get the carbonation that you want. Um, the advantages there are one, uh, the other option is basically to um, basically blow carbon dioxide up the arse of the tank and carbonate it to the level that you want. But when you do that, you're stripping some of the uh, volatiles, so some of the hoppy aromatics, which we've uh, carefully uh, massaged into the beer. So we don't want to do that. So bottle conditioning helps preserve a lot of those uh, aromatics, uh, but also you get um, a finer carbonation. So the, the, the carbonation, is, the, 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 the bubbles and the foam is, is, is smaller and, uh, and it's, it's what they call finer. Um, and that improves head retention and lacing and all that sort of good stuff. Um, also, you've got yeast in the bottle, and yeast is the most natural antioxidant that we could add to beer, so it gives it a level of protection against oxidation. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a lot of advantages to bottle conditioning, but obviously it's very risky. Um, if you don't get it right uh, and you mess it up and you've got... Lots and lots, lots of bottles that can't go to market because uh, uh, you've got it wrong, basically, um, and that's why a lot of brewers don't actually don't actually do it. But um, we, we set out you know, little creatures to make the best possible beer that we could, and we felt that yes, using leaf hops was one way, not pasteurising beer was another, but also bottle conditioning allowed us to. Um, kind of uh, make sure that we uh, kept a lot of those aromatics in, in the bottle, carbonated it naturally, put some antioxidant protection in there. And, um, and also as well, I suppose, there's a viewpoint that's not particularly well understood and the science is uh, not great, but it's, it also acts as a polishing step. So you get that secondary fermentation and just basically, from a simple perspective, the yeast absorbs a load of um, unwanted stuff and excretes a load of good stuff. So it ends up to it ends up polishing the beer and refining it um, and making it I don't know more drinkable, more delicate, more balanced, more refined. Basically, it's a lot of advantages, but it's very difficult. And if you get it wrong, it's very costly. So uh, there we go. Um, Rush, you sound like you consider yourself a bit of an expert in bottle conditioning, so it's fantastic to have you on. Um, it does go wrong. I, I won't ask you, but I will mention for the cost of comment, what happens to the little creatures yeah. Emerson says on um, about five years ago with the recall with that? With I'm glad right? you've mentioned that, uh, <laughs> uh, Costa. I still have sleepless nights over, <laughs> over the Saison. So, um, yeah, we did a collaboration with my mates at Emerson's. And uh, we made this fantastic beer. It tasted awesome. And uh, Emerson's had grew some saison with this yeast, but we're a little bit sketchy uh, in kind of being open about the um, the impact of using this particular yeast strain. But we did a whole heap of work in our lab, basically, in terms of force aging and force testing to make sure that it hit terminal gravity. And everyone was absolutely adamant. All this testing proved that the yeast had done its job. It, it had hit a wall 
and we were good to go to pack. That was great until we packaged and then it went to some warehouse and it was probably 40 degrees and all of a sudden the yeast decided to uh, have a party in the bottle and uh, <laughs> and basically the yeast got to the beer before any consumers and brewers could actually get to taste it unfortunately so we had to uh, we had to do something else with it and we sent it to our friends at White Rabbit I believe to do some work and, um, and sour it or something but Yes, it was um, heartbreaking, Costa, heartbreaking. That- well, yeah, I can imagine, mate. I can imagine. It was, um, I remember being out in trade and looking for it to come on, so it's a shame that it didn't get out there. So that's all right, Russ. We're all good now. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> we, guys, like I said last week, we did go for an hour, and we will be going over an hour this time to let you know we are up to 65 minutes, and we still have a few things to get through yet. So if you're willing to, to hold on tight, um, that's fantastic. I did see a dreadnought picture come up, and I did pull this out of the fridge earlier. Um, you talk, a lovely, you talk. A, lovely, a lovely bottle of, uh, of dreadnought um, from a few years back now, one of the rehashes of it, which is very lovely. So I'll see how we go. Um, and there was a couple of questions there saying, you know, can we do this all the time? Look, hey, if you, if you pay me money and I might be able to wrangle these guys out and uh, show their faces on screen again. There were a few questions with um, a brewing with fruits. And I think this is a very interesting one. We did have a good conversation with about this during the week. So um, MJ, you've had some experience with this some some Little Creatures Limited releases and one that we did have at Fremantle, Fremantle Beer Fest last year. And remember, guys, the winning beer gets to go on at Fremantle Beer Fest. So this is an interesting one. Um, how Brewing with fruits, how much do you use? Tell me, tell me what goes on there and any issues you can run in with. Well, it's a good question. Um, ultimately, it's really up to the brewer how, mu- how much fruit you want to use in your brew and, and what type. So last year we brewed uh, a couple of fruit beers. We did one with pineapple. So we made a pineapple pale ale. Um, that was to support a, a street arts festival here in Fremantle, which was great. Lovely, uh, lovely little festival around Easter time. Um, and then late, uh, late last year, we brewed a beer called Raspberry Dreams, and that was to support some festivals uh, in Victoria in January. Um, and we used uh, and we used raspberry puree. So I guess um, it's really up to the brewer what type of fruit they use and the amounts. Um, you, you can add the fruit in different stages of the process. You can add the fruit uh, towards the end of boil. So if you're working with fruit that's um, that I guess if you're not sure if it's um, aseptic or not, so i.e. if it's sterile, you might want to add that toward right right at the end of boil just to give it a little bit of boiling time just to make sure everything's sterilised. Um, if you're working with aseptic fruit um, that you've purchased and you're comfortable that it's sterile, you can add that fruit during the ferment. I wouldn't add it at the, at the end of ferment you want to add it during the active phase. So probably about halfway through the ferment, you want to uh, bung that fruit in so you can ferment those sugars out as part of your fermentation uh, program. Um, So there's a couple of little ways you can use your fruit. Um, So as for the amounts, you know, you you probably want to use between, you know, 5 to 10% of your grist composition in, in terms of fruit. It's probably a good place to start. What uh, we had a discussion before this one, and just to make sure people who are adding fruit for a new thing, um, concerning what can go wrong, you add it. You mentioned adding it to ferment. Obviously, we're fermenting the sugars out. What if we add the fruit after ferment and yeast is still present? Well, what can happen then is you can you can run into some problems if you go and package that beer, and particularly if you bottle it and you've got um yeah residual extract i.e sugars in your in your bottle home brewers generally don't filter so therefore you're gonna have a presence of yeast and then you can start generating some activity in the bottle um you won't be able to release that co2 so you can really start to over carbonate the product to the point where you could you know you could have um you know a breakage um so that's that's probably i wouldn't recommend that method i would recommend adding it during the ferment, ferment those sugars out, develop the fruit character, um, you know, 
after the, the ferment, you chill down, you'll take all the, the yeast off, take the fruit pectin and, and skin off, and then you should have a really nice colour and flavour. And I'd, I'd probably go that way. Yeah, there are some fantastic beers out there that have fruit additions. And I personally, for the guys out there, want to know, I, I love wheat beers. And whether it's an American wheat, um, you don't like wheat, wheat beers with American wheat's rust with fruit. I think they're fantastic. Um, 21st Amendment last year in San Francisco, hell or high watermelon, perfect at 38 degree on a 38 degree day outside Oracle Stadium. Um the it's important to know that guys and just i probe mj for a couple of questions on that one because if you do decide to submit a beer that has fruit uh where there's a wheat beer or like um make sure that you adhere to those because we're not really keen on having or we don't want you to submit beers that end up exploding in a um in an aeroplane half traveling across the nullarbor um, because of it's kicked on a bit of a fermentation and done a a little creatures emerson's russ gosling special <laughs> um mj uh step mashing um do you step mash and, and i guess tom too do you step mash in home brewing and what is it is it necessary to do so these days um look it's really up to the brewer it, it, it's a it's a philosophy and it um and i think i touched upon this last week with regards to decoction mashing so there's a whole heap of different mashing schedules that the, that a brewer can use you can you can have acidification rest so temperatures in the high 30s you can have protein rests at around 50 degrees celsius um maltose rests in the low 60s etc um and you can do an, a, any number of combinations of different types of rests and it really depends on what you're trying to achieve versus the beer style you that you that you want to produce um uh i'm just trying to think of some examples so i mean yeah little creatures pilsner for example that was a step mash that we did so we mashed in low we want to produce an amount of maltose or simple sugar um, and then we would step that up into an area where we're going to have more alpha amylase activity so up around 70 low 70 degree mark and then we, we would mash out at 76 or 77 c mash off and then we'd start to lauder from there um yeah it's really up to the brewer what they want to do and what they're trying to achieve so if they're working with um so i guess like i, I covered the last week if you're working with material that's under modified so cereals that haven't had the level of germination as opposed to other malts then you may wish to consider a protein rest or or um, some decoction mashing to, to offset those um, issues. Most of the malt that you'll buy today is really well modified. Um, so i.e. The, the, the process that it goes through, it's, it's, it's really well, it's, it's very homogeneous, I would say. Um, so, you know, infusion mashes sort of in the mid to high 60s is probably enough uh, for most people to work with. But if you're really keen on on trying different characteristics um, and, and trying different things, then absolutely go ahead and try different uh, mashing schedules and, and then, you know, write down your experiences, write down the results you're getting and then, you know, and do, do what works for you, I think. Yeah, I tend to agree with a lot of what MJ said there. I think one of the beauties of home brewing um, is the ability to tweak those things and one of the my favourite parts of the process to play with was the mash and playing around with different different step mashes um as you also touched on mj you know the malts that we use these days um in terms of proteases and um their uh the enzyme content that they have there's a few older rests that perhaps aren't um as necessary as they they used to be um but really the science is sort of not quite out on that yet. And in terms of what you want to do at home, um, I think, as you said, have a play around, see what works for you and see what you like, see what you don't like. But it's, it's one of the nice parts of the process that you can really play with um, on that scale quite easily um, without too much difficulty. So um, it's definitely something to sort of explore um, and tweak as you go and see what you like. There's a question there from Mick. Um... 65 degree versus 68 degree any difference um 
for commercial brewers, there's a heap of difference. Um, it can be it can be really black and white, um, and and it really depends on the beer style that you're brewing. So, for example, if you're brewing dark beer, um, if you're using a grist composition that has a lot of high molecular weight malt, so a lot of crystal malts, etc., then you may wish to bring your temperature down to produce a bit more maltose, so you have more fermentability and produce more alcohol. Um, that three degree difference between 65 and 68 um, can have significant differences um, in, in large scale commercial brewing. It's, it's, it's a very, very big difference in temperature, even though it looks small. Mm. Um, before we get on to some of the post questions, and there are a few things we were going to try to get to guys, but it has dragged out and not in a bad way. Definitely fantastic with some of the questions coming in from the side. Um, Ali, I'd like to just touch a base because there were a few uh, female brewers out there who just wanted to get to a, a little bit more from, from your perspective on your journey, what the industry was like when you came into, industry, into the industry and what it is like now and a little bit about Pink Food's impact on that industry, on the industry now, what it's um, looking to achieve out there in the market with supporting female brewers. Um, so I'll start with what Pink Boots is about. So I'm the current Australian president of Pink, the Pink Boots Society and Pink Boots is a not-for-profit organisation for women beer professionals. And what that means is that it's open for any woman who earns any part of her income from beer, whether she's a brewer, um, you know, behind the bar, marketing, sales, maltster, hopster, whatever her role is is she's welcome into the organization and the aim of the organization is to empower women through education so we do lots of stuff throughout the year um, numerous brew days sensory events panel discussions uh, visits to different breweries supplier visits to like maltings and whatnot um, and we also offer a scholarship program as well um, so when i started in brewing I think there was about three or four other female brewers in Australia and Pink Boots in Australia hadn't even started. And then when Pink Boots did start, there was about seven women and now we're over to 400 members the last time I looked at the membership list. So it's just grown massively. And for me, one of the biggest things um, that's, I guess, well, it's actually continued is that so many women were like, I thought I was the only one. And so it's this sense of recognition when you find another female brewing, you're like, I thought I was the only one. But it's really amazing now because I actually saw on Facebook um, a few months ago, somebody had asked a question of like, what breweries have a female brewer? Because somebody was putting together a tap showcase. And the list of breweries with female brewers just went on and on and on. And it was basically most breweries now have a female brewer. So it's um, not that unusual to come across female brewers. And as I said, Pink, Bo Pink Boots has just grown from strength to strength and um, is getting bigger and more amazing with each year. And um, if anyone wants any more information, they can find Pink Boots Society Australia on Facebook. So like everyone, we're moving towards doing some more virtual events until the COVID restrictions lift. Grey boots. Who wants to join grey boots? I don't want to put grey boots. Oh, um, well, Ali, grey listen, boots. Russell. Great. Yeah, Russell's ginger boots. Um, <laughs> oh. um, Ali, there's some great... Uh, great feedback coming on about pink boots on there, but there is a specific question that goes back into brewing. Somebody wanted to find out from you. Um, never brewed before, but doing some Googling around, what are your thoughts in the brew in a bag method? Oh, I think, yeah, I think it's just you, you start with whatever you're comfortable with. So, um, you know, my first home brew was like a tin of like extract and it was a ginger beer. <laughs> like I think it's, you brew with whatever level you're comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with brewing a bag. Yep, it's awesome. Wonderful. Um, there was a, I did get a message through now for the guys that are looking uh, for Kavik. You've, you've stuffed me up with this Kavik thing. <laughs> I'm just going to stay Kavik. And that's going to be my Australian way of saying it. 
Um, it's not on the yeast list, but it is now on the yeast list. So if any, everybody out there is looking to do something special and to stand out and want to do something with Kavik, I think that would be fantastic. Um, there are a hell of a lot of questions out there still, but before we get to some of those questions, I might just um, reiterate that some of the things around the masterclasses um, that Masterclass One has been published on the website and on Facebook. There are some questions coming through asking if Masterclass is going to be put up. It is up there. So if you go to the Facebook, it will take you to a YouTube site um, and then you can watch all four of us before Tom came on and get um, plenty of excitement and information and valuable stuff out of it. But it does, we did go through a lot about um the competition and particularly getting everything right at the first instance. So everything that you submit will be judged. So it's a, it's a three part process, not just the beer that you finish with, but also the ingredients and also your method with coming up with the concept, which is obviously got to relate to the brief. So make sure you get that right. And you've been working on that because again, not only is this a home brew competition, we want to help you guys out and get into the way that um, when you scale up into professional brewing and large scale brewing, how we think about bringing beers to the market. And it's very much about not only the wow factor and what's on the palate, but also your reasoning behind that. Um, so have a look at that one too. You are given till June the 10th to submit. So what is it? It's a 14th of may right now so you've got that one and um for the concept of the recipe um brewing should be finishing up by around about the 18th of june so you still have enough time to mash in and get something going on so if you've already got something piping along and now you want to do a quebec now is the time to get it into there as well and make sure as russ said it takes practice not do we we don't always get the brew the right on the first time in the 50 litre sand kit we might not get it till the third time. So we're happy to, we're giving you the time to be able to do that um, and refine. And also, as the guys mentioned, take notes. Make sure that if your brew didn't go right the first time, take notes. That's fine. Yes, it does take time for delivery, um, but we've got time to make sure we, we can get them at the, at the time. Um, the only There's only a few restrictions we have on styles and they are around sours and barrel-aged beers. So unfortunately, we can't. Um, be doing sours and barrel aged beers at this stage. We can't be putting in, um, those yeasts into the Fremantle Brewery. Um, it's safest, obviously, only use one of the pre approved yeasts. So they're all in the FAQs, including the ones that we've added tonight. We can only do one submission per person. So just keep that um, down. So don't, if, unless you want to bring your um, adopt your cousin and uh, get them to submit one under your behalf, but um, please keep it into one. And that's not a secret way to get in through the back door. A few people asked what it's meant by standing up against other beers at Fremantle Beer Fest. What we mean by that is we don't want um, you to brew a beer that's a clone of one of our beers already. And I've done a lot of festivals. I do about 40 per year. I'm always running around the country doing something like that. We want something that stands out. We always bring our old favourites because Little Creatures Pale Ale, is, people still ask for it. They still ask for um, Elsie and they still ask for Rogers and all our, all our favourite beers, but they st uh, we still want something that stands out. You can use influence from traditional styles, but give us something with a little bit of pizzazz and that might be the yeast, that might be an addition of fruit or um, MJ mentioned last year when he used Othmantha's flowers in our Gab's beer, which is a tea. So it could be anything like that. So be unique about it and also add that into your concept and give us a reason for it because we will be judging those to go on to be finalists based off those. Um, you can pair up with someone to brew this beer, um, obviously, as long as you're observing social distancing. Um, the main prize only covers two people for a visit to Fremantle Beer Fest, though. So there's no two people plus partners um in there too um and if you're for the challenge if you're submitting your, your malt bill just submit it on percentages don't worry too much about kilograms just work out the percentages when the guys are pretty adept about scaling it up as well so that really covers off most of the items um around there too and then you will get to come and have some fantastic beers of this over there at Fremantle beer fest and like i said the thursday night before the festival where we um, we launch it um is is great there are a few more questions here. Um, I'll try and pick another couple um, before they go in there. There were a couple on hops. Um, uh, any thoughts on the use of Mochueca with Simcoe and, and, and Amarillo and a Pale Ale? I don't know if anyone wants to jump on those or talk about those style of hops. Yeah, Simcoe, Amarillo and... And, and Mochueca. Mm, okay. Um... 
Yeah, I mean, we use Simcoe and Amarillo um, the creatures. Um, I have them for some time in our IPA. Um, now, Mochu Acre is an interesting hop. We used to use that in Bright Ale, and we used to use Leaf Hop. Um, and we actually found it to be quite... Um, Quite vegetative, quite um, quite unpleasant actually, if I'm honest. Um, and so we stopped using it, but I know some brewers really like it, and I, I, we never used it. We never used pellets, but it'd be interesting to play around with some pellets. I don't know with Tom and Ali, I've got a view on Matthew Laker. We used it. He almost had a bit of a decaying character. We we thought we didn't we, we didn't really like it. Amarillo. Yeah, we really like. Great, great hop. Um, what was the other one again? Uh, Mochueca, Amarillo and Simcoe. Simcoe. Oh, fantastic. Simcoe, Amarillo, fantastic. In fact, our oh, Little Creatures IPA has got Simcoe, Amarillo and Mosaic in it. Really, really good beer. Um, yeah, so the only one I'm not convinced about there is Mochueca, but again, we use that uh, as the leaf hop, not as pellets. Um, uh, other, other brewers might, might have a different view. There's some lovely um, New Zealand pilsners using Macho Waker, isn't there, Russ? I'm sure there is, mate. I'm sure there is. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, um, I'll, I'll take the other side of the fence on that one. I think it tastes mm -hmm. beautiful in those. Um, there was a question. People keep wanting to know not about your just your moustache, Tom. People want to know a little bit <laughs> more about you. Um, has been no more single comments come up, but I really want to know about, I guess, there's some home brewers out there who would like to make that professional step up into professional brewer. So a little bit about how you caught the bug of home brewery and how you translated that. And then when you got to where you are now, so did you always step straight out of there to little creatures or, or how'd you get there? Yeah. So, um, home brewing for me was purely a hobby, just a hobby during uni. Um, I was studying environmental science at the time. Um, and sort of just got into it via a friend who was doing it and it sort of just interested me. Um, I think from a science perspective as well as a um, sort of something that I just never really understood in terms of drinking beer a lot but not really understanding how it was made. Um, so the hobby for me only really lasted sort of two years maybe before I really became quite obsessive with it. Um, I went and did the IBD general certificate course um, at Regency TAFE. I was obviously quite lucky living in Adelaide. Um, Regency TAFE just across from Cooper's was, was really accessible for me. So I um, went and did the course with Stephen Nelson there um, and was applying for a few brewing roles at the time of doing that course um, and ended up getting a um, job offer from Bright Brewery up in Alpine, Victoria. Um, and sort of made the made the jump into the industry that way. So it was sort of a combination of um, the science degree definitely helped, but for me it was about trying to get. Um, I, I'm assuming that when a when a brewery has um, applicants apply for a role, that that list is quite big. I pretty much just thought, how do I get myself to the top of that list? How do I how do I give myself something that other people don't have? And a formal qualification is a really really good way of doing that. I think. Um, you know, it, it's very hard to have 100 people apply for a job with the exact same qualification um, and a qualification being just a hobby. So going and trying to find some sort of formal qualification definitely helps. Um, and after that, you really start to put yourself towards the, the top of the list. Um, and, it, and it shows that you're sort of dedicated to, to actually want to do it. You're not just throwing applications out there to um, try and get some work you really are prepared to put the time and effort into learning um, because there's not too many uh, owners or head brewers that I'm aware of that um, would be all too happy if you just made all your mistakes on their 20 or 50 hectolitre brew house. Um, so after moving to Bright um, which was a really really good opportunity for me had a great uh, head brewer in Richard Chamberlain who's now at Two Birds um, that's where sort of obviously the learning continued and it, it doesn't end. Um, so I started doing my IBD diploma as well um, while working full time. And once again, that's just um, something that allows you to advance your knowledge, advance your skills. Um, 
And eventually after two years at Bright, I got a call from Little Creatures offering me a gig down here in Geelong. So um, if I had to wrap it up into a few things that people should try to aim for, it's, it's go and get a qualification. Um, probably you're going to have to at some point think about moving. Um, I was relatively lucky being 23 at the time. Um, I didn't have a family or a house or anything. I didn't have any reason to be bunkered down in Adelaide. So I had the ability to essentially pack up my stuff and move to Victoria um, with about three weeks notice. So um, being prepared to make a big move. And I know a lot of brewers who to get into the industry had to do that. Um, and then, yeah, really just making sure that you set yourself up with the knowledge and the skills to actually do well in the industry and, and to set yourself apart from everyone else that is really just um, trying to turn a hobby into a career the quickest and easiest way possible. That's a, um, a beautiful way to bookend a fantastic masterclass, mate. You started us off with a charming moustache and great look, <laughs> and you ended us with a really lovely journey, which I think I really hope that was going to help a lot of people out there um, who are looking to get into brewing. Uh, folks, we have dropped off in quite a few numbers and we have been going for an hour and a half. It is time to start to get your logbooks out and start thinking about um, your recipes and your concepts and start to get brewing. Uh, we apologize for this. There are a lot of questions that weren't answered, but at the end of the day, we will um, endeavor to answer them. If you get onto Facebook in your inboxes, but please make sure as you go along and you're brewing, take a photo, put on Instagram, put on Facebook, hashtag little home brewers and we'll get in there. I've been, I've been searching them up all week, going to see what's going on um, and liking it and getting involved in it. So it's really good. Um, to get in there and see that. But are the que as the questions come through, and I have a massive uh, Word document there on all of them coming through, especially about water, um, inboxes. We'll get back to you. When, what happens when we get the inbox. We'll copy it, we'll paste it, we'll send it to MJ, we'll send it to Ali, we'll send it to um, Russ, and we'll send it to Tom, and we'll get some answers back to you to help you. Again, we're here to help you in a collaborative homebrew community uh, to get these beers out, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and we hope, definitely hope to um, see you. So share your thoughts and share your journey. Um, thank you again. Make sure you head to the site. The FAQs have it. Um, if they're not there, just go straight to the social media DM. Thank you for everyone as a beer lover. Um, and I'm sure the brewers feel the same. So put your hands up, guys, um, for, for coming on and enjoying it. Uh, we will definitely see you on the journey over the coming months. And um, I think we'll, we'll definitely be back next year or two with these masterclasses for the next one. So cheers to that one, guys. Yep. I hope you have a fantastic evening and, and thanks for joining us. Yep. Thank you very uh -huh. much. Cheers, thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs>